When a royal goes on tour, huge consideration is given to what they eat. Just, <laughs> just a little bit, just a little bit. Individual tastes taken into consideration. They might say, well, Prince William likes curries, or, you know, the, the Queen, for instance, famously, doesn't eat shellfish. Not because she doesn't like it, but because, obviously, shellfish can give you an upset stomach, and if you're doing an important diplomatic tour, you don't want to miss a day because you're sick. When our younger royals have been faced with unfamiliar delicacies, they don't always maintain their composure, as Emily Andrews witnessed. When I was on tour with William and Kate in 2016 in Canada, we were at this lovely kind of presentation of seasonal Canadian produce. Sun was shining, Kate was looking gorgeous. I was like, oh, this is lovely. And suddenly we see this clam called a geoduck. It's very phallic looking, kind of long tube and kind of a bulbous part at the end. <laughs> it's a delicacy and you eat it. And so Kate and William were kind of going around the stores and we were all, all as pressed, kind of waiting for them to present it, this geoduck clam and what would they do? And bless them, they both tried it. They managed to stifle any kind of giggles. There was a slight giggle from Kate. So the etiquette there would just be to pick up the food item, have a little nibble, make some polite remark, and then place it down. Try a bit, think of England, carry on. I think they had a chopped up bit. They didn't have to put the whole thing in their mouth, which would have been pretty gross. Whether it's hosting a state banquet or barbecuing in Balmoral, the royal requirements are the same. Produce must be locally sourced and sustainable. It's an attitude that now seems surprisingly modern. They were long into seasonal food, long before high street, supermarkets, restaurants, because um, they understood the produce and where it came from. For Prince Charles, this interest in how food was grown became a passion. He introduced organic food into all the royal palaces. I mean, apparently he used to set up at Sandringham kind of literally with armfuls of organic produce from Highgrove. His personal house in Gloucestershire, and Prince Philip was like, what's this? So oh, Charles's kind of, you know, funny little habit. Prince Charles is notorious in country house circles, for when he comes to stay, he often brings his own food. Not everybody thinks it's a good thing to do, but people put up with it. You know, it's one of his eccentricities. Prince Charles was mercilessly mocked when he professed his love of organic food. He believed and saw very early on the damage that pesticides could cause. Organic farming delivers the highest quality, best tasting food produced without artificial chemicals or genetic modification. He was very instrumental in pioneering in creating a garden that was pesticide free. In 1990, Prince Charles established Duchy Originals, a brand through which to sell organic produce grown on his High Grove estate. Charles really was a bit of a groundbreaker because he was championing organic food and sustainability before it was particularly fashionable. Years later, and the brand has gone mainstream. I think back to 19 years ago, when we launched the first oat biscuit, and there were huge headlines saying a shop soiled royal. So in an even more soiled capacity, I'm here today, just to say nothing could give me greater pleasure than to unveil this. Sales of Dutch Originals at Waitrose have now exceeded £1 billion and also raised £27 million for his charitable foundation. So he's clearly very pleased about that. A newer member of the royal family has also used food to champion a good cause in kitchens far removed from royal palaces. Before Meghan even joined the royal family, she was making private visits to the women of the Hub Community Kitchen where women had gathered to cook for the community. This is the one project Meghan has made her own. The community kitchen in the shadow of Grenfell Tower the Duchess of Sussex has been coming to for many months. And she said how she instantly felt very at home and very welcomed by that community. And a big part of that was this sort of common love of food. It was clear Meghan has a strong bond with the women who come here. She comes and laughs with us and then she knows about our family, we know about her, so it's, it's and she came up with the idea of making a cookbook. So using all the ladies' recipes and indeed her recipes to raise money for this community kitchen. With the attention that someone of her celebrity can bring to this cause, the book has been flying off the shelves. 
the money that it raised was ploughed back into the community kitchen. It was completely renovated. And I remember at the launch, Megan said that she felt that she'd almost come home meeting these ladies because it was a kind of such a, a melting pot of different nationalities and identities and how food bound them all. Before she met Harry, Megan wrote publicly about her love of creating in the kitchen. We know the most about her in terms of food in comparison to anyone else because, of course, she had a blog called The Tig where she wrote about her love of food and she shared recipes and she spoke about the meals that had influenced her and what her view on food was. She likes to eat clean and green. There's reports of her like wanting to eat vegan during the week, so very much kind of plant-based food, and she certainly doesn't, I don't think, eats a huge amount of red meat. The modern royals seem to be much more interested in food, healthy eating, and I think that's exciting. Famously, Meghan and Harry got engaged as they were trying to cook a roast chicken. It's a standard, typical it's night for us. It's a cosy us. night. It was what we're doing, just roasting chicken roasting and having... Chicken, <laughs> trying to roast chicken. <laughs> trying to roast a chicken. I think Harry said trying to cook a roast chicken. I mean, we know that Meghan is a very accomplished cook. Very romantic. He got on one knee. Dana roast dinner, but that's great. That's, you know, shows that they're normal. It's something that we can all imagine doing. It's not something that we think, oh, well, that's because they were royal, they were doing that. And any meal they eat can make the news. But it's not always a welcome headline as a friend of Meghan's discovered on a visit to Kensington Palace. He posted what I'm sure he felt was a very innocuous photo of avocado toast and wrote that Meghan was the avocado whisperer because she does such great avocado toast. One newspaper absolutely went after Meghan for eating avocados, saying that they are involved in the exploitation of workers abroad and how it's a controversial thing to eat and how dare she uh, promote the consumption of avocados. An unconventional life in the limelight hasn't stopped the brothers from having an ordinary approach to food. We're living together as brothers and it's fantastic, it really is. He does most of the cooking, I just laze around watching TV. If you think about William when he was at university, he did have that regular university experience. You know, he lived with other students and that he did the things that other students do and that would have extended to the way that he ate as well. He certainly wasn't up in St Andrews with a chef who was preparing his meals. You know, that just wasn't happening. And same way with Harry when he was in the military. He didn't go with his own chef. It was very much a case that he fitted in and did what everyone else did. So they do have that pretty ordinary relationship with food. They're bring up to modern day, aren't they? <laughs> it's the new kids on the block. Harry and William don't want to live like grandma. When William and Kate had apartment 1A at Kensington Palace renovated, they famously had two kitchens put in, one kitchen for them to use personally and also a professional kitchen for hosting events at Kensington Palace. Kate in the papers was dubbed Two Kitchens Kate. I've had conversations with her about how much she loves to cook and she certainly likes to cook for the kiddies. When faced with a baking challenge, Kate can definitely rise to the occasion. William, however, could do with a little practice. Swing across. Yes. Yes. <laughs> All right. No. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> it sort of looks like a pretzel. Of course, when we think about the royals, and particularly the Queen, you know, they have loads of staff to do everything for them. But actually, Kate cooks a lot of their meals herself. And I think she likes to do that, because like most of us, that's the heart of her family life. Whatever the royal family eat, and wherever they are, the eyes of the world are watching. They are very much on display, and every engagement that they do, they are watched very closely. We might have to come down here for lunch. <laughs> Everything they eat and drink becomes the story. And even though the modern royals have a more hands-on approach to food, their chefs will always have a vital role to play. Kate will not be queen in a tiara going shopping around Waitrose. That's not going to happen. She wouldn't have time in any case. She's going to be too busy. But whoever is on the throne, the royal kitchens will always be at the heart of the monarchy. Food is very important when it comes to the way that we function as a country diplomatically. That's going to continue to be a key feature in the future. It's the engine oil for the engine that is the British royal family.